you everybody for being here. We're really excited to kick this series off. Um, this is the first of what will hopefully be many of these sessions. Um, <clears throat> I am going to, first and foremost, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Shagan to tell everybody just a little bit about Harmony Venture Labs and why we're here and what we do. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Trevor and Hunter. And thanks, Emily, for the introduction. It's always weird hearing yourself getting introduced. Uh, so, but what's HVL? HVL is Harmony Venture Labs. And um, it, it's the next iteration for me and I hope um, a good chunk of my life's work for the next several years of my life, uh, hopefully for decades. And the idea around HVL is really um, around a couple of things. Number one, having been very fortunate with a prior startup and learned a lot uh, in that journey. This is a vehicle for doing more of that. So within HVR, we have really three core, uh, and we call them legs of the stool. We have a venture studio, which is where we take ideas that we believe should exist in the world, either internally generated ideas or ideas that have come from uh, other founders, primarily very early stage ideas or doesn't exist at all um, if it's internally generated and we turn them into products that turn into companies. We fund those ideas, build teams around them and then help them execute to become successful companies. And the reason why that exists is because we just, I, I personally believe that Birmingham is right for uh, continuing to build startups and grow startups and I believe we can have a core group of people that can have great ideas and then go execute on those ideas. So that's what the studio does. We create, we come up with an idea, we create the idea, we validate it in the market, we launch it, we fund it, and we build teams around it and help it be successful. And then we have the part of this of uh, HVL that's really around acquiring uh, existing SaaS companies and turning them into Birmingham companies and making them part of the Birmingham ecosystem. And we have some parameters around the kind of companies we look at, but primarily they need to be SaaS businesses, uh, selling to businesses, uh, which is our own area of expertise. And then we help those companies continue to grow. And then we have a third part of uh, HVL, which is really what we call advisory services. And advisory is both inward and outward. And what that means is there is a core team at HBL that advises and works closely with the HBL affiliated companies to help them grow and do things uh, in a way that helps them scale and be very successful. And in some cases, where appropriate, uh, the advisory team at HBL will work with external uh, companies that are beginning to get some kind of traction at a particular stage in their development. Uh, we take our own playbook and try to execute it with those companies to help them find uh, success. So the core uh, theme here is really around growth, uh, growth of the tech ecosystem, successful exits down the line. And what we believe at HBL is that if we look decades down the line, uh, HBL would have been a big facilitator in creating billions of dollars in value here in Birmingham. And uh, it would be a place where startups grow, where people go and build things. So, so that's what, what it's really about. Uh, and that's a summary of HBO. Cool. Thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> so today we're talking about uh, fundraising in the context of startups. So this is one of the questions that in my uh, consulting career and, and continuing into working with uh, HBL, comes up time and time again. How do I get money? How do I get money? What does this process look like? Um, what do I need to do? Uh, it's a pretty fraught time for a concept at the early stages and those kinds of decisions need to be considered very carefully. So that's why we started uh, with this topic. Uh, I wanna give everybody a little bit of instruction. So if you have questions as we're going through this conversation, there's a Q and A uh, function in the bottom panel. Um, but also one thing I just thought of is if there are any subjects that you would like to see us cover, please feel free to drop those into the chat, maybe not as a Q&A, so it doesn't clog that up, but love to hear 
from uh, our attendees what they want us to talk about and tackle in the future. So um, that being said, uh, let's lead off. So I'm gonna start with Shagan here. Um, give me some of the most common misconceptions around fundraising that's held by early stage startups and their founding teams. Oh, uh, this is a, so this is a, there's a lot of common misconceptions around uh, startup. Uh, th there is a tendency to take an exception and make it the rule. So that leads mm -hmm. to misconceptions. Many times misconceptions don't just come out of thin air, right? There are seeds that lead to them. So I think, uh, I, I don't know which, which ones I would say are the most important misconceptions, but I would say some of the ones I've seen are uh, one, the idea that my idea is so good, it's going to get funded. <laughs> uh, yep. uh, there are lots of good ideas in the world. There's really nothing special about your idea. And funding is going to be hard for you, especially if you're a first time founder uh, and this is your first rodeo. You just have to be in it. See this as a nine month journey which is why I, I try to tell uh, founders that, look, don't make fundraising the focus of your job. Uh, the focus of your job is to actually build a product and get customers, not raising money. So that it, people need to go into this with the realization that your idea may be great, but you're not the only person with great ideas. The process of fundraising is not easy. It's very hard. So one is this idea that I have a great idea, so I'm going to be able to raise money. Another one that kind of ties into that, but on the flip side is I have no network, so I can't raise money. Having a network makes it easier to raise money. But, or should I say not having a network makes it slightly harder to raise money. But really, investors are in need to make money. And the way they know to be successful at making money is to bet on the person and look at this person and say, one, this idea is solid. Two, this person can build a team around themselves to go execute on this idea. And three, this person can actually successfully build a product. That is what investors are looking for, not whether you're in their network, especially in a place like Birmingham where lots of people are willing to help you. Um, you are being judged on those three things. Uh, can I trust this person's character? Are they, do they have greed? Do they have resilience? Do they have a growth mindset? Will this be somebody that we can learn together and help each other? And that after we talk about something, they will actually go execute on it. And it starts from your deck, to be honest with you, not your business plan. I think it's important for you to have a business plan. But your deck is actually the first thing somebody's going to look at and judge you by. And mm -hmm. then when you come at it with just a lackadaisical attitude and it's not top quality, your deck to an investor is the first product that you've built. That's how you want to think about it. So when you send a deck and it just doesn't look well, it's better for you to have a five, 10 page deck that gives you credibility than to just have a bunch of stuff on a piece of paper or anything else like that. So mm. that, that is what people are really looking at versus do I have the network or not? It, it doesn't matter if you, even, if you have not been known to build great companies before and you just come to somebody, you have to build credibility somehow. So, uh, or the idea that you need to have a perfect answer to raise money. Experienced investors know that there is no perfect way to build a company. Mm. So you, you just have to have some key things answered, which is, do you really believe in what you want to build? And are you the person that can build it versus everything else that people worry about? I, I don't know if Hunter has any other misconceptions to kind of address. Yeah, no, all of that is, is really good. I mean, I think that um, one of the misconceptions that I see is first time founders thinking that fundraising is the hard part of their journey. Um, and I kind of tell people all the time that, you know, fundraising can feel all consuming when you're going through it. 
Um, but ultimately, closing something like a seed round really just kind of gets you to a starting line. It gives you the space to then go do all the hard things that is going to mm -hmm. be required of you. You know, the hiring and firing of, of people, building processes, selling your product to customers, um, developing your product to meet a real market uh, need. And so all of those are the real hard things. Although to a founder who has limited resources, it can feel like fundraising is the big mountain to climb. And once you've climbed that mountain, it's, it's a little bit smoother sailing. Um, fundraising can just sort of give you the space uh, to, to have more options, but all the other tasks, once you've kind of you know, climbed that mountain, are, are challenges in and of themselves. So and that's a, go ahead. One thing I would like Trevor is, you also don't have to raise money. And sometimes you, you, you come to investors and they look at your business and they're like, well, this business either doesn't have to raise money or doesn't have to raise money yet. Um, and you have to accept that too sometimes and look at your business. There are all kinds of ways to fund the business. Mm -hmm. The best way to fund the business is through your customers. So if you actually have a way to really fund your business through your customers, it's actually the best way to go. And in today's world, there are tools like Pipe. If you go to pipe.com and you're actually able to start getting revenue from, from, uh, from customers, uh, you can have funding that is non-dilutive and not debt laden that can still help you kind of accelerate your growth. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and then you have family and friends around, you have all these other rounds that can be very small, help you prove out what you're trying to do before you go to an investor that feels like you're way too risky at where you are for them to put money into your business. So you have to think creatively too and not just think, I have to go raise money. Uh, there are various ways to, to go about it. Yeah. Pitch Hunter, something, you know? yeah. Something you said um, kind of leads me next into one of the things I wanted to cover today is uh, <clears throat> this concept of fundraising can feel all consuming, but really there is, uh, there's other work that needs to be done that sort of leads down that path. And so I was wondering if you could kind of give us a, a recap. You did a little bit of this, but let's revisit it. Um, of you know what what kinds of things do startups um, early stage companies really need to be focusing on right um, to prepare for raising money what where are the big uh, where are the big uh, critical paths that they need to be really intently focused on yeah I think there's kind of a couple of um, paths for this this question I mean the the first the first thing that every founder should know is when do you run out of cash, right? So you have to know kind of your zero cash date. Um, and then once you've sort of assessed your current um, resources and your constraints, then you say, okay, if my cash runs out on this particular day, then what are my options to sort of prolong that, right? And so Shagan touched on it already. Um, you know, the best way to, to, to give yourself more runway is to um, bring in revenue, uh, which gives you more oxygen, right? Um, you know, your second option is to cut expenses. Your third option is to raise money. So in this context that we're talking about, fundraising as being the mechanism where you give yourself more, more runway, then the question becomes, okay, what signals do I need to be sending two prospective investors that would make my business or my idea investable, right? And you know, there are a number of those sort of early stage signals, but the first one in terms of the area of focus that you asked about, Trevor, is really nailing the problem, right? Um, too often, uh, if you skip these steps, and you sort of assume the problem or assume everyone feels the same pain that, uh, that, that you know, of the problem that you're, you're feeling um, and you haven't done the really dirty work of getting out of the building and talking to customers and really identifying their pain points in a very acute way, um, you've really lived with the customer's problem. Um, investors are going to detect that and, and they're not going to, you know, they're not going to respond favorably to a bunch of assumptions. They want to see how have you sort of validated that you have a mastery of the problem 
uh, that you're trying to solve. And then, you know, have you have you actually built a product uh, or or started down a path of building a product that that offers an effective solution uh, to solve the problem? Um, and if that solution were effective, you know, how how big of a solution could this be? How big is the problem, right? So the the whole framing your activities in the earliest days around identifying the problem and sort of creating the solution and then validating that problem solution cycle uh, with real customers uh, is really kind of the key area of focus. And then you know, there's really no better signal than getting folks that you don't know to pay for the solution. So, um, you know, that's obviously you know, you can whiteboard it all day long, but if you have a, an early version of the product in the field and it's solving a problem and customers are paying for it, that's a really good area to focus in terms of thinking about the, the types of signals that would be appealing to uh, to the investors. Hmm. Yeah, that's <clears throat> interesting. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the the work that that I do in the validation process, and and in a in a sense, you know, contextualizing fundraising around uh, runway, right? Being able to being able to keep going when you skip those early steps, you actually make the problem worse. You force yourself into a position of having to raise money probably earlier than you need to, potentially diluting your ownership of uh, your your product and company uh, earlier than you need to because you've skipped some steps um, that you can do relatively inexpensively that take a lot of work. So, Shagan, anything you want to add to that? Okay. I think that's cool. Good. Yeah. yeah. Let's see how we're we doing here. Yeah. Okay. So, actually, you can uh, take this next question. So, what are some of the signals? You know, we kind of covered this here, but we're really, this is a little bit different. What are some of the signals? If you've got a, an early stage concept, uh, and, and let's say you're in the market. What are some of the milestones and or signals that it's time for you to start looking for money, right? It's time for you to start considering fundraising. That's to shaken. Yeah, so <laughs> people give you money because they want a return on their money, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the, the big thing people do when they raise money is they raise money because they need money. <laughs> well, that's not the business investors are in. And you have to realize that. People want to give you money when there is a clear milestone in front of you that would lead to a higher value for the money they've given you. That is when they give you money. People don't give you money. There are always exceptions to the rule. Obviously, there are always exceptions to the rule. But people don't give you money because you don't have money to do what you want to do. That's not what mm -hmm. they give you money. People give you money because you have something repeatable, like your output, your input and your output is clear. And they know their money is going to help you get X input and you're going to get out X output. You, your, your next milestones are clear and those milestones are going to increase the value of the business. People give you money for that. If any of you watch, watch Shark Tank, you know what I mean. Like you go to Shark Tank and your customer demand as I've stripped your production capacity, all five sharks are gonna be running at you to give you money. <laughs> um, it is clear why people buy your product, clear enough that they're telling other people about your product, even if it's at a small scale, people will give you money. But mm. there is this idea that, oh, I have this idea, but I don't have money to do it, so I'm gonna go raise money. That's not why investors give you money. They don't give you money because you need money. They give you money because when they give you the money, it is clear what the next milestones are. And that if you get to those milestones, your company that was worth X will now be worth X plus Y. That's mm -hmm. why people give you money. So when you're at that stage is when you go raise money. Mm -hmm. Before that stage, if you need money, you can pray to get lucky and find an investor and spend your time doing that. Or you can find other ways, keep your day job if you have to. Uh, investors don't want to, for example, give you money so you can pay yourself a salary while you see if your idea is going to work. Like, how does that add value to their money? It doesn't. Um, you know, having a pitch deck where a substantial amount of the money at the earliest stage of your company creation is about paying you, doesn't leave it 
compelling argument for mm. <laughs> the investor for them to give you money. So that is why you, you, it is hard for you to skip the stages before you go ask for money. And that's why sometimes it is easier to get friends and family around and prove certain things, maybe small things in what you're trying to build before mm. you go do it. Um, if it's very research intensive, there may be other avenues that you have to pursue to, to get it going, but you have to have clear milestones, clear input and output, and clear value creation activities that the money is gonna to go toward for investors to wanna to give you money and for you to wanna to go raise money. Otherwise you're about to be irresponsible with other people's money when you mm. raise money. So that, that's, that's when you want to go raise money. Yeah. Hunter, anything you want to add to that? That was good. Um, you know, I think that's right. A clear and coherent path forward um, of here is how we're going to deploy this capital to boost your value and the company's value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds to me like we're, we're really kind of all batting around the same bush here is that those early steps, those early stage validation steps, you know, building an MVP, doing it uh, relatively inexpensively, delivering some value um, and finding traction really is, is the, the first and primary focus. But that input output is uh, a really good way to think about it, Shagan, being able to demonstrate that, you know, X in puts out Y is a, is a great way to think about that. Um, and, and sometimes that means you totally rethink the problem you're trying to solve. So mm -hmm. uh, I've heard people come and say, well, I know what I want to build, but I don't know how to build it. So I need money to go hire somebody to build it. Maybe mm -hmm. the first thing you want to do is actually convince somebody to come join you on the journey that mm -hmm. can build it. And that person becomes your co-founder. And mm -hmm. you guys figure out what can we do in the meantime that gives us this tiny little revenue we need to be able to validate something for this yeah. first stage. So you, you kind of have to be, creative around getting to your final destination beyond just money, money, and then like think about what, what problems do I need to solve as I, as I go along this journey. Yeah, that's half the fun of uh, the startup process. At least I think so. I enjoy that. Um, cool. So we've covered a lot of ground here. One of the things I wanted to jump into this uh, this conversation is really in, in the context of early stage ideas and, and concepts. And so I'm speaking from experience here, and maybe this is just my lack of, of knowledge, but uh, sometimes the world of fundraising and the different tools and strategies uh, is confusing. So I was hoping, um, you know, that we could discuss maybe the maybe the top two or three uh, fundraising strategies that are most appropriate for a, uh, an early stage concept. So let's assume that they've gotten to the place, they've got an MVP in the field, and uh, there is a clearly, clearly easy to define input and output, right? So what do we want to start thinking about now? It's time to, it's time to put some gasoline behind us. Um, Shagan, I'll, I'll actually, yeah, Shagan, let's leave with you here. So th there are different <clears throat> avenues, but when you're talking about uh, funding a company, you have um, certain standards that have become standards now. Mm -hmm. uh, and good bookkeeping and record keeping is very important because this is gonna catch up to you later on. If you're randomly taking money from people, but you don't know the terms under which you've taken money from those people, and then in the future you wanna raise money, you're going to run into problems because then the people are going to say, who owns the company and what do they own? And, and mm -hmm. this is something that has to be clarified before you can really yeah. raise, uh, especially from institutional investors. So there are certain mm -hmm. vehicles that are out there. You can go through debt that converts to equity, which is what you get with a convertible note. A convertible note just means I'm giving you this money but we're not setting a price on the equity of the business. But in some future term, due to some future event, this money, this note that I'm giving you that is debt now, that may have interest on it and may have other terms. For example, the convertible note may have a discount on the future value of the company that the note converts to. 
at some point, this note is going to convert into equity. Convertible note holders do not own any of the company, but they, are, they have a right to owning the company at some future. Mm -hmm. Then there is a safe note, which is like a convertible note, but a very pared down convertible note. Safe just means a simple agreement for future equity. So it kind of explains itself. That's what safe means. So you have a simple agreement. I'm going to give you X dollars. And this X dollars are going to turn to future equity hmm. in the future. And then you have a priced round, which is when you, re you really say, hey, my business is worth $3 million and I'm selling you 1% 1, 1 of it. I'm selling you 500 shares at a share price of $10 a share or whatever. So those are price rounds. Hmm. Even when you do friends and family or when you raise from VC or anything, recommendation is you got to pick one of these standards as what you took that money on. You price your company, you have a convertible note, you have a safe note. You can also go raise debt. Debt is way risky for startups, especially early stage startups, and you're personally on the hook for the debt uh, versus safe notes or convertible notes or priced equity rounds that you do not have to be personally on the hook for. Uh, I would recommend that if you're talking to an investor that doesn't understand these terms, that you either explain it to them first before you take their money <laughs> or you don't take their money if they really just don't know how this works because the last thing you want is for this person to think you're going to be paying them dividends and then there are no dividends <laughs> or, or crazy things like that. Uh -huh. so, and I've seen this. So I've seen this. I've seen, uh, I've seen somebody give money to a, found, a startup and then the person needed the money and it's like, hey, I can't, I, I need that money back. I have another issue. That's not how it works, you know. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a debt like that. So, so you have to make sure that at least the person understands what they're getting into in terms of the relationship. But yeah, if you think about it, it's debt, uh, sale of equity, either to a VC or private equity, whichever one, um, uh, price round, safe note, convertible note that you can raise from friends and family. You can raise from institutional investors. You can raise from angel investors across, across the board. And then these days you also have vehicles that will give you funding that is non-dilutive and non-debt. But typically that means you're already generating revenues and they can use your revenue projection to say, hey, we're going to give you X and you pay it down over time. But we're going to pre-fund you. Mm -hmm. We're not going to take any equity in your company and it's not a debt. So those vehicles are beginning to show up in the marketplace also. Okay, got it. Hunter, <clears throat> you've uh, you've had a couple of startups and, and you've raised yourself. So I want to hear your thoughts on this. I was laughing when Shagan mentioned about uh, the confused investor. We've I've had that uh, firsthand. Um, and so uh, I think the, the advice is that when Shagan talks about something like a convertible debt structure, that's something that if, uh, and I, I'm a big fan of that because it allows you to sort of punt on your valuation before the company is really ready to properly be valued, you know, uh, have a, a, a solid valuation based on the financials. So the convertible debt structure makes a lot of sense. What, what, what I ran into was that I had some high net worth individuals who wanted to invest, um, but they weren't uh, really fluent in tech startup investing. And so the convertible note concept was uh, not something that they, they were very familiar with sort of the, you know, what Shark Tank has popular, popularized, right? Which is I give you X, you give me Y, um, you, know, you give me a percentage, um, you know, We'll set aside the fact that Shark Tank has completely screwed up the math uh, to be a popular TV show. There, there's a whole like pre pre money valuation, post money valuation that they're not touching on that show because the math is complicated. That's a separate topic. But um, I'm a big fan of the convertible debt. What I found was that explaining a con uh, convertible debt uh, to these um, you know prospective investors who were ready to sign checks, they couldn't. One in particular who was really going to be the lead investor couldn't wrap uh, his mind around, um, do I get interest payments and then my money converts 
no, that's not, that's not how it works. You don't get all your money back plus interest and then you get the full equity conversion. That isn't, that's not really a thing. And so I would just say for a founder, you know, work with an advisor, an attorney, someone who can really equip you to not just understand the investment vehicle and strategy yourself, like a safe or a convertible note, but you should be so fluent that you can clearly articulate it uh, to a novice, um, you know, who who really needs help understanding what happens to their dollars um, when they invest and what the expectations should be. Uh, and you sh apparently should do a much better job than than my feeble attempt to con uh, explain the convertible debt structure to uh, prospective investors, because we ended up having to shift to a straight equity round, which is just what people understood. I think that has changed. Um, I think Birmingham, with uh, more influx of capital into the tech startup ecosystem, I think you have more fluent investors. And so you're not going to get a lot of glazed over. You, sh you hopefully shouldn't get a lot of glazed over eyes when you um, mention something like convertible debt, which is good. That's a sign of progress for the whole tech community. Um, but the point is, whatever path you decide to choose, um, make sure that you can clearly communicate and set the expectations because a confused investor is, first of all, not going to invest and worse, invests through the confusion. And then you, you're just prolonging the problem and setting yourself up for a uh, a major, um, you know, issue down the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is, uh, it's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So to all of our attendees, we're getting close to the end here. So if you have questions, um, questions for us, please pop that in the Q and A, uh, the Q and A section, you can find that on the bottom menu um, in Zoom. Uh, last question that I have, this is uh, something that I don't hear a lot of conversation around when, when you, bring external funding into your into your concept you now have someone else who has a stake right in your business um and i'm interested to hear your thoughts uh hunter i'll lead with you on on how does this change the focus and the culture of a company like what kind of impact does that have on the team and and how the team operates together and how their uh mission and objectives are aligned any any insight from that yeah, I mean, the kind of the first thought is that, you know, the closing a, a funding round, uh, typically um, those dollars are going to be deployed to a certain end that you have sort of articulated on the front end to the investors and, and hopefully communicated, you know, at an appropriate level to your team so that there is an expectation of, you know, why we're raising and what we're going to do with these dollars uh, in an effort to sort of reach the objectives that we've all sort of agreed on, right? And so the dynamics of the team are likely going to change. If you are a small team, you close a seed round and then your team, you know, adds headcount, doubles or triples. Um, you know, your role as the founder is going to take on a different, uh, you know, it's gonna look a little different. And typically your co-founder or the earliest employees that you've um, brought on, the earliest team members, you know, their roles will likely change as well. That has an impact on uh, culture, right? On, um, you know, on sort of the dynamics of everybody's role and how they see you as the founder, how they interact with you, uh, the amount of time they can get with you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So all of these things in my mind, just to give a 30,000 foot view of this is around, around expectation setting, um, both with your team with your investors and then being honest with yourself about how how your role will be evolving when you take on this capital and you really start to accelerate your 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 strategy or accelerate executing on your strategy um, and so you know i think some of this can be resolved on the front end when you hire people you want to hire people with a growth mindset especially early on who have an expectation that you know, at some point we're going to raise some some money, and we're going to really go, and and they're along for the journey. They they may not know exactly what to expect, but at a high level, they're not shocked when you say, "Hey, we're going to go from X headcount to you know three X headcount uh, with this new injection of capital." You want to screen for that on the front end as best you can, and hire the people with with the right growth mindset, and then just be transparent in your communication about what the plans are because. Uh, it's all going to evolve. 
Shagan knows this way, way on a, on a scale much larger than I do. Um, but uh, each each funding round and each milestone typically brings some dy- some team dynamic changes, and you just want to try to do your best to set the right expectations uh, as early as possible. Yeah. So so just think about a scenario where um, you've brought somebody on to the company. They know they're getting underpaid from a market rate standpoint. And then you go raise a lot of money. And now they're like, okay, we have money. So can you double my pay? When that happens, you did something wrong up front. Okay. So that means you just didn't carry your team along uh, in the context of a startup. So what you want to do to really prevent that is to make sure everybody is in the process with you. Everybody is in the process in terms of what you're trying to raise and what you're going to do with the money, Um, which may include, hey, we're going to top up the team and the investors should probably know that too, because then if you run out of money because you spent it all on paying the existing people, but you don't execute on anything, (laughs) that's the problem. Uh, And the people know, I'm making a sacrifice here by being underpaid in this small, tiny startup, but I'm being compensated with equity. Like, it just needs to be clear. Like, the, the one time that the fundraising events are always exciting for the team because it means you don't die yet. <laughs> you <may still> die. <laughs> it means you don't die yet uh, because you now have money in the bank. So it should be a moment celebrated even though it's just one tiny step in the journey, but you should celebrate it. But you should celebrate it knowing that if it is not clear what happens next, this same money is gonna become the source of pain and anguish on the team. When people start feeling like what they thought the money was gonna be for, especially if it's personally affecting their lives and they're putting in certain sacrifices. If they now think what the money was gonna be for is not what the money is for, Hmm. Well, if you turn around and you start paying yourself better, but they all know that and nothing is happening to them, like you all just have to be on the same page. You have to show the sacrifice if anybody's showing the sacrifice, you and your co-founders, if you have any. And you have to be clear around this is what we're going to go accomplish with these resources we now have within this time frame. It's just very important to, to bring the team along. Hmm. Uh, now, you may not be able to bring the whole team along at a larger, larger company, but your leaders should still kind of know what's going on so that they can help manage the, the, the but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about startups here. And in the mm-hmm. case of startups, the team really needs to be aligned in terms of what's going to happen to the point. Um, you know, at HVR, we probably have less of a problem with this, given that we internally fund our own ideas and then accelerate the, the growth. Uh, but uh, external normal businesses that just go raise money, you really have to be clear. And even we're still clear on what we're going to use the funds for versus just yep. random stuff. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Is, uh, this is uh, the, the last opportunity. Anything on either of your minds, um, Shagan or Hunter, that uh, we didn't cover that you'd like to add to the conversation? Yeah, I'll I'll add just one. We kind of talked about it earlier about these misconceptions. Another one that I think is uh, interesting is that there's a misconception that all all investor dollars of the same amount uh, have the same value. In other words, uh, you know, uh, the the misconception I think to dispel there is investor A, B, and C offer you fifty thousand dollars. Those sound equal, but you know, maybe investor A has domain experience and a network that can really help you execute on your vision. Um, and it sounds obvious that there's strategic value beyond just the monetary value. But the other thing I want to caution people about is, you know, investors, um, you, you also don't want to take on investors that, for lack of a better word, are just jerks or or have a personality conflict that your your co-founder and this investor are going to be oil and water for the next five years. That's going to make your, your life miserable. And so um, 
we, we spend a lot of time, I think, as founders thinking about how we will be uh, evaluated by the investors, but uh, there's nothing wrong with making uh, an evaluation of the, the right investors that you want to bring onto your team, just like a, an early stage hire. You, you, want, you want the right people on, on board, um, and that includes the investors, investors who can add strategic value and who are going to be um, assets and allies and not going to be um, you know, conflicts and, you know, constantly butting heads. It's not about some, you know, uh, just a, a bunch of, you know, people who always agree with you. It's about a, an infrastructure of trust and, and alignment on the vision. Um, and if you get the wrong one, um, you know, in a position of power, that can, you know, constantly be a source of stress. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I would just add that, look, it's okay to raise gradually. If you really do see that you want to raise, don't pause the life of your business for a raise. Um, if you can raise gradually over a period of time and use it to actually execute on the business, you can actually increase the value of your business for those people who will come later and now they have to pay mm. more. So what, yeah. what I mean is, let's say you're trying to raise half a million dollars and you're struggling to get there, but you're able to raise a 100K and you can really increase the value in a clear way, the value of the business with the 100K. Raise the 100K, increase the value of your business and make the people who would come in later pay more versus the people who actually took a bet on you. There's really nothing wrong with that. As long as it is yeah. clear the value that you don't, don't do last week and then next week you tell the guy who comes next week that he has to pay more. That's not what I'm talking about. I think that's going to piss people off. Um, but I'm saying if you find out the, the, the fundraising journey is a tough journey for you, but you're able to get some traction and that traction is enough to show value creation, you should take it, show value creation. And now you've shown people that you can actually increase the value of the business. That's one. Two, look, 99% of the time, except you're in a studio setting like HVL, your investors are not the doers. Don't go to an investor with the impression that they're going to do the work. You do the work. It's clear, okay? They can help you ideate. They can help you make connections. But that board meeting, whenever you raise that money, there's going to be a lot of action items that come out of it. You go do those action items. That's your job, not their job. Uh, so mm -hmm. don't go into investing thinking, oh, I got people that will do the work. That's not really how it works. There are some uh, investors that will go above and beyond for you and actually even do the work, but that's not how it typically works. So uh, just to clarify that for you. All right. Well, I really appreciate um, Shay and, and Hunter, both of your time. I think this has been a really, really valuable conversation. Um, I don't have any questions in the Q&A here. Um, so with that, we'll wind this down. Um, if you are interested in talking to us about your, your concept, we're always willing to have uh, a conversation. It would be great to, to have us introduce ourselves and learn more about you and your concept. So you can find us by following us on LinkedIn. Um, and you can also reach out to us via the website at harmonyventurelabs.com. Um, but with that, I really appreciate everybody's time and uh, we'll talk to you next week at our next uh, Launch and Learn. Thanks everyone.